Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for coming and join us in, in this webinar this morning, afternoon, or oh, evening, just for you. So my name is Claudia Pirani. I'm from Brazil, a board member from BPW Brazil, and also a member of the United States States, yeah, United, United Nations Standing Committee. We've also invited Vilma Barbosa from International Affairs Committee Coordinator from Brazil to help us as much as Bettina also is going to be with us. It's a pleasure to be together in this Monday for this panel that is part of BPW International's program of parallel events within CSW 68. We have here a great team of experienced women who will bring us a macro view of the subject, our theme, our, our title, Breaking Barriers, Transforming Institution for Gender Responsive Change. This session will delve you to the role of institution in advancing gender equality with a focus on dismantling barriers that hinder progress. Finalists, and the speakers will discuss the importance of uh, institutional reform, policy advocacy, and the integration of gender perspectives in decision-making decision -making processes. The session, this session aims to provide actionable insights for policymakers and organizations to strengthen institution in the pursuit of gender <clears throat> equality. Before we real start, I would like to tell you that this parallel event will be recorded. Questions can be entered at question and answer section. If you are using your mobile phone, probably you won't see the question answer sections. Uh, but if you, you are using your computer, you are able to. They will then be read out by Bettina and answered right after the speaker's presentation. The chat is not open, okay? But at any time, you can write down in question and question and answer section, and then we can follow, proceed with your consideration. To start our webinar, I'd like to invite our VP, uh, be, uh, yeah, our VP to the opening remarks Please, dear Toiting, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claudia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Dear BPW sister, for all over the world, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as I am a vice president of BPW International, it's my honor to welcome you all in this CSW 68 para virtual parallel <laughs> event of our BPW International under the esteemed leadership of Dr. Catherine Boshard, our BPW International president. Today, we unite from across the world to dive into urgent topic of breaking barrier, transforming institutions for gender responsive change. Institutions are the backbone of our societies, shaping policy norms and opportunities for all individuals. BPW International continue to champagne gender equality advocating for institutional and to all our past, um, I would like to, um, from my heartfelt to all our participants, your present here today is a testament to your commitment to gender equality, your voices, experiences and perspective are essential as we collective strive to break down barrier and build a more equitable world for all. Let 
us approach our discussion with open mind and heart. Let us actively listen, engage, and learn from one another. True progress requires collaboration and solidarity. Thank you to all our panelists and participants. May our discussion be fruitful and we will empower to implement positive, positive change in our communities and the world. And I wish I have, we have a great success and thank you. Thank you, dear VP. Thank you for your remarks. And also, before we proceed, I'd like to tell you that the Q&A answer is not a chat. So please keep it there with your questions, OK? And uh, following our webinar, uh, I'm very honored to call our international president, Dr. Catherine Bushart. So please, dear president, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good day, good evening, good morning to everybody. I'm very, very happy to see you here. And my background, which I have, it's it's a fake background, but I'm in fact in the Caribbean preparing our next Congress. It doesn't look like it's at the moment. I'm in my hotel room, but uh, stepping out, it would look like it. So I invite all of our BPW members to come next November to St. Kitts, in uh, the Caribbean. What I would like to present to you today is uh, not so much a general approach on how to break barriers, but a case study BPW International did under my triennium uh, theme, new action through corporations to help women to have access to uh, finances and to expand their businesses. We are aware, very much aware, uh, of the fact that women have difficulties to access financing for their businesses. I'd like to announce that BPW International has just, means end of October 2023, signed a global partnership agreement with UN Women for the next few years, that means until 2027. And this uh, partnership is not limited to a, one continent, it is a worldwide partnership. Wherever we have clubs, they can become an implementing partner and key player in UN corporation on the ground. This MOU focuses on fostering women's economic empowerment. Claudia, could you please um, put on the PowerPoint? Highlighted as one of the four thematic areas of UN Women's Strategic Document 2022 to 2025, in line with the Sustainable Development Goal, number five, achieving gender equality and empower all women and girls. In concrete terms, our ambition is to create the first network of inclusive trademark BPW ecosystems, including the creation of incubators with a gender dimension. It will thus be the first international women's organization with a global network of incubator for women's entrepreneurship, each managed by one of our clubs. To achieve this, the MOU proposes to leverage multi-donor partnerships to provide specific support solutions, including coaching and incubating programs with a focus on improving the export capacity of women's SMEs. So you see here, we have the building, first are the incubators, then the second phase would be the Women's Trade Expo 2024, that would be solely organized 
by UN Women, with the cooperation of us, of course. And then the th third phase would be extension of the project to other areas. So, uh, yeah, you can put on the third, next one, Claudia, please. We have the partnerships, that is the first phase, aiming for an initial fundraising of between 3.3 and 4.9 million US dollars to support the creation and development of women's business centers in strategic locations around the world. So any club with a program to set up an incubator for women's entrepreneurship will, thanks to this MOU, be able to go to the regional and national offices of UN Women to seek funding from other UN agencies or international donors to set up their programs without having to wait for calls for tender or go through a selection process, which is already shortening this process very, very much. To reinforce this fundraising action, BPW International with UN Women New York's headquarters will now also negotiate global funds directly with large institutions such as the World Bank and other big foundations. We are thinking of framework agreements of several million US dollars to reinforce this strategy and be able to contribute financially through BPW International Headquarters to projects where federations or clubs would not have enough funding for their programs. For the time being, and you see this on, this, on the screen, uh, we have agreed to launch a pilot project across the whole West and Central Africa, but we have already a strong interest manifested from East Africa also. This month, we will be holding meetings in Senegal with UN Women Dakar Regional Office to set the agenda. No, can, can you go back? Claudia, please. Uh, to launch two pilot programs to set up inclusive incubators in the region. One proposed by UN Women in Sierra Leone in partnership with our club in Freetown, and the other by, U, uh, by BPW Dakar in Senegal. Other projects are also on the agenda for the 13 countries in the region that have a UN Women office. You see, we see them named here. Uh, Burkina Faso has no UN Women office uh, in the country but they have a UN representative. So we are working through the UN representation. The other key objective of the messages of the meetings in Dakar is to contribute to the organization in 2024 of the Women's Trade Expo, which will be the fourth edition of the series of Expo on Entrepreneurship that UN Women carries out annually in a region of the world. Also foreseen in the MOU, uh, this is also part of the MOU, UN Women has proposed to celebrate it in Africa this year, probably in Dakar, placing women entrepreneurs in trade at the center of Expo 2024. BPW International thus becomes one of the UN Women's key partners for its organization, along with the International Trade Center, with the International Labor Organization, and UNDP. This Expo 2024 will therefore seek to capitalize on the results, achievements, and impact of the launch of incubators and inclusive programs to accelerate women entrepreneurs' access to trade with a particular focus on the African continental free trade area, a great opportunity for us to boost women's trade. The organization of the 2024 version of the Women's Trade Expo will build on the experience of the three previous editions, which each time brought together over 50 countries on multilingual platforms 
and mobilized hundreds of women entrepreneurs at each edition. Each year, there are more than 100 entrepreneurial stands receiving several thousand visits over three years, three days of activities, more than 300 one-to-one -one meetings and networking events, and hundreds of networking requests. With this agreement, all BPW clubs and federations will be key players in the Women's Trade Expo. Finally, just a reminder that this MOU is open to all clubs and federations worldwide from today. Details of this MOU will be shared with you in the coming days on the BPW International webpage and we will be setting up a team to coordinate this new dynamic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. Thank you so much. We are delighted with the news and we are so happy that we will be collaborating worldwide. Thank you so much. Um, dear Bettina, do we have any questions? The questions we had so far were about a translation and this has already been answered, the translation is activated. And another participant was asking whether it's possible to request the presentations and recording afterwards. It has also been answered, the recording will be published on the website bpw-international.org. That's all. Great, this is case. Thank you very much. And uh, I know it's a very complex topic. topic. I had uh, also in the executive, it took them some time to understand the whole uh, mechanism. We have had last week a big event which uh, UN Women organized and they were looking for funds for the World Trade for this expo. And at the same time, we got also a chance I could present and talk about the MOU. And uh, we were also getting in touch with quite a lot of uh, buyers. And we hope this, uh, we, this we will follow up with these uh, meetings in the next uh, weeks. So I really hope that BPW International will very soon be able to set start with the setting up of these incubators. Uh, I know that there were rumors going around in Africa, oh, there is no money involved. There is indeed money involved in the sense that you and women facilitates us very well the access to the big buyers and uh, will help us also to get funds. We don't get funds from you and women, but we get funds through them with their main main actors uh, which, uh, who finance them. So that is a big advantage. And I think that is a, an incredible help. It's breaking barriers. It's not so much changing you and women, but it is facilitating the, uh, let's say, our women entrepreneurs, the uh, enterprises of them to come to money, to get access, to have access to uh, really big things, to get a, an education. We will first train the trainers uh, according to a um, system that has been developed by the JZ, that is a German Society of International Development, mostly financed by the German government. And uh, they have established a fantastic program. Also, UN Women and ITC have developed certain programs in, to which our women will have easily access and we will be supported by the regional or country to local UN women organizations. So that is a a fantastic advantage for BPW International. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Katerin. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as we we don't have any more questions, Dr. Katerin, would you like to say something to close your uh, speech? Something else? Then we could go to the next speaker. I guess she's done. So, our next speaker is Dr. Jenny. 
Dr. Jenny is awardee of the Global Exemplary Education Double Gold Award and the Global Exemplary Innovative Leadership Diamond Award from the Global Women Investors and Innovators Network, UK. Mary Curry Social Impact Award and the Fellow Art of the Royal Society of Arts. Currently, she is the UN Standing Committee of the BPW International, Board Trustee of the Association for Young Environmental Journalists. Dr. Jenny, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. It's an honor to, to be with you today at, the, at this uh, incredible side event and, uh, sorry, parallel event. And we gather here not just as uh, policymakers, as advocates and scientists and leaders, uh, but we are also here. I think I am, can you hear me? Because I think I, you're hearing me well? Because what I'm, I'm, I'm only looking at, uh, I'm looking at Vilma. So I'm not sure if I'm. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, you yeah, can so, hear you well. Yeah, and you can see me, right? Okay, perfect. All right. Just wanted to check. All right. So we are here as catalysts for a transformative vision. It's a world where gender responsive strategies are not merely encouraged, but they are a foundation for our institutions fabric across. And this is what I'm going to talk to in the next uh, few minutes, science, diplomacy, the space economy, climate communication, and artificial intelligence. And with that, please allow me to share my slides. Just a few seconds. Okay, are you seeing my slide or hopefully in full view? Yes, okay. All right, so first of all, um, this is will be my topic uh, revolving around science diplomacy, space economy, and the climate and climate communications for gender responsive change. But first of all, let's define what gender responsive strategies are. And gender responsive strategies uh, for the purpose of this presentation are those approaches that actively consider gender perspectives and aim for quality throughout the planning, implementation, and evaluation processes. So this means that we have to ensure that our strategies, both men and women's needs are met, voices are heard, potentials are unlocked, leading to more equitable and effective outcomes. So in the realm of science diplomacy, where I uh, revolve in, science diplomacy bridges the gap between nations through scientific collaboration. We share knowledge, we solve challenges together. That's why it's very important for scientists to talk to each other and also to, for scientists to talk to diplomats and for scientists also to talk to NGOs such as PW. It plays a crucial role in prom promoting gender equality by ensuring women's participation in international scientific projects and decision-making processes. So science diplomacy here not only fosters peace and global understanding, but also champions the inclusion of diverse perspectives, and it's crucial for innovative solutions. So in the realm of science diplomacy, we have witnessed time and time again how collaboration across borders can solve our most pressing global challenges. Yet for too long, women are underrepresented in these conversations. It is not just about fairness here. What we want is effectiveness. So diverse perspectives, especially the voices of women, would lead to robust solutions. So we have to make sure that gender responsive strategies are in science diplomacy. Now let's turn our gaze uh, to the stars because, and I, I mentioned this because this is something that is very new, but it's, uh, it's now a growing industry, which is the space economy. The space economy has unprecedented opportunities for innovation, exploration, and economic development. Yet, for this frontier to truly benefit humanity, it also must embrace gender equality. So involving women and underrepresented groups in space science, technology, engineering, and math is crucial. And when, and when we turn our, our uh, gaze to the stars, the next, uh, the space economy, this, it offers really this potential, but it can only be realized when it also makes sure that women are completely invo involved and also when girls are also not just looking at the stars, but also becoming part of the conversation. So for more robust and sustainable growth in space, so beyond our earth in space, uh, women and girls have to be included in this conversation as well. And of course, we talk about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is something that has really shaken 
all of us. You know, it's not just about chat GPT, but also in many other formats now of artificial in intelligence. And yes, it does um, hold transformative power across all sectors from healthcare to education, but also to space exploration and climate strategies. But here, the potential to advance gender equality is particularly significant. So we have to incorporate gender responsive algorithms um, in ensuring diverse data sets because AI can actually help mitigate biases. It can enhance female participation in the tech world and provide innovative solutions to gender specific challenges. Um, there was a last year I attended a, um, a parallel event Call, uh, and there was this presentation on the coded gaze. And uh, one of the speakers said that the problem now with the technology that we are in is that if we are not represented, especially in the conceptualization stage, even in the ide ideation stage, not even when it is when the technology is fully functional, but even in the when it is still being created, if we are not represented there, then when it is fully functional, it will miss us. And if we are missed, then we do not exist. So it's very important to have this, uh, to propel this conversation further. And I wanted to share that uh, just recently, just a few days ago in the European uh, Union, uh, you know, we, I am, I'm based in Europe at the moment, the, we, the, the parliament has just passed the first regulation on artificial intelligence, which is the EU AI Act. And the use of artificial intelligence in the EU will be regulated by, by this law. This is the world's first comprehensive AI law. So the, the aim here is that uh, for AI systems to be safe, transparent, traceable, and non-discriminatory, and also environmental friendly. So it's very important uh, to incorporate this uh, because there are to eliminate biases, um, to foster an environment where women and underrepresented groups are integral, you know, to the AI revolution. And so we can make it, we can use it for our purposes, and it is used well, and we are not missed. And here, of course, when we talk about science, when we talk about uh, the inclusion of, of, of women, when we talk, even when we talk about space, when we talk about AI, it's, all, it's very important because this is the only world we live in. Even if we work, even if we have parallel lives like in the internet, which we are you know, using at this moment to connect to each other from different parts of the world, we have to remember that we are living in one earth we have only one planet. And this is the reason why um, we have to be part of the conversation as well. You know, while we use technology, we have to keep ourselves grounded and make sure that we, we love our earth and making sure that the earth is heard. I sit on the board of the Association of Young Environmental Journalists. And this is, uh, and then though we use technology, we make sure that uh, we are, you know, we are continuing these conversations, you know, on, uh, in, in the planet. So our, our planet, of course, faces a climate crisis that affects every one of us, yet not equally, because women, especially those in vulnerable communities, often bear the brunt of environmental changes. But they are also at the forefront of innovative climate resilience and adaptation uh, strategies. So gender responsive climate communication and policies ensure that these strategies are recognized, they are scaled and integrated into our collective response to climate change. So this is very important to have inclusive action that we can build a, a sustainable future for all. So, as a, in, in a nutshell, I can talk to you forever, but I only have 10, uh, 10 minutes. So in a nutshell, it is imperative to have gender responsive strategies. So when we talk about um, space technology, we should pioneer inclusion. The space sector stands as a beacon for what is possible when we commit to gender diversity and inclusion. So when we actively promote participation in, and leadership of women in space technology, we pave the way for groundbreaking discoveries and innovations that not only benefit women and girls, but also the whole of humanity. When it comes to science diplomacy, making sure that conversations between science and innovation with policymakers and even us as, as NGOs, we have to bridge gaps with equity. So science diplomacy thrives on collaboration. COVID was a very good example. We were able to respond with, uh, to COVID very fast because everybody got together. All of the stakeholders are got together. But we have to prioritize gender equality efforts to showcase innovative solutions 
Congress to address the SDGs, showcasing the power of diversity in solving complex problems. When we talk about gender resilience, we have to look also at gender inclusive action. We have to talk about gender responsive strategies. We have to engage all voices, but particularly those of women and marginalized communities. So inclusivity here is key to developing effective and equ equitable climate solutions. And finally, for AI. AI is, should shape the future with diversity, but making sure that we don't lose our humanity while we respond and use the technology that is given to us. So the deployment of AI cannot be overstated, but institutions must, must ensure that AI technologies advance gender equality, mitigate biases, and foster inclusivity at every stage, especially during the ideation stage. So the call to action is clear, my dear sisters. We must transform our institutions to integrate gender responsive strategies at every level. And this transformation is not just a moral imperative, but a strategic one. So when we ensure our policies, initiatives, and collaborations across science uh, diplomacy, even at the world beyond our earth in the stars, when it comes to climate action, when we make sure that the AI is inclusive and equitable, we unlock the full potential of our global community. So I would like to thank you for your commitment to breaking barriers and for transforming institutions for gender responsive change. Together, we can and will make a difference. Thank you very much. Wow, that's wonderful, Dr. Jenny. Wonderful. I love it. Uh, technology is already in our lives and we need to be part of it and motivate more women to take in, right? Definitely. I love it. Different places, but one, only one word. That's wonderful. So that, uh, dear Bettina, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. One question was about the transcript, but that will be published as well. The answer is sorry, no, the recording, will, uh, only the recording will be published. But the second question is for Jenny. Um, that's from Kazia Gitonga, and she asks, he or she asks, Jenny, could you kindly give examples how AI can increase female participation and reduce biases? Thanks. That's a wonderful question. There are many ways that AI can, uh, you know, be this place of an inclusive, you know, a more inclusive world. When we use AI, things become faster the thinking process becomes fact faster. Therefore, the responsive responsiveness, uh, our responsiveness becomes faster. So when we use it properly, then we can use it for, for our purposes to make sure that things are, that we are present in the conversations, that we have a seat at the table, that we, uh, we you know, do our, our leadership or our decision-making process uh, much faster. So that's, that's one way. The other way is, you know, if, uh, if we use AI, let's say in, in science, and I'm a scientist, so I always, you know, my fallback is always in science. We use AI in science and we make sure that representation there is present. We make sure that uh, whatever we create, you know, uh, has has this gender uh, gender uh, involved. But we have to make sure again that we are part of the ideation, ideation process. So we shouldn't wait until you know the the AI has been developed or ChatGPT has been developed before you know chat gpt or anything uh, you know that is uh, that is generative ai or, or or some derivative is being developed any technology while it is being conceptualized while it is still a prototype we have to give our ideas as well so that when it becomes functional then we are present and therefore we can use it for for whatever purpose that we need to make sure that we have a gender inclusive world. There are a lot of things that we can do with AI. We are still just discovering them and uncovering them. And I think um, the fear now is if we are missed, and of course, if there are, um, if we cannot, uh, if we, if we are not, uh, we are not in a leading role, but um, there are spaces where we can create more, we can define more our strategies together. And of course, in any technology, you know, I, I see technology as a hammer. It's not neither good or bad. It really depends. You can kill a person with a hammer uh, or, you know, you can make it to build a house, let's say. So it's really just uh, dependent on how you use it. I will send some, some resources in the chat. Um, might be useful, you know, for a happy reading about how you can use AI to more, for a more gender inclusive world. Thank you for the question. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. Bettina, any, any more? Yeah. yeah, more questions have just come up, but <laughs> oh, sorry, do you hear me? Mm, I will have to yeah. read them first. Um, for the African women, they have access at about 90% for, uh, at the new technologies or also at the internet. And for them, it's uh, um, not accessible. Uh, um, the artificial intelligence is not accessible. Sorry, I'm translating from French, so it's stammering a bit. Um, What's, what's our future? How will we do? And the second question is, uh, what negative AI can affect in our society? Indeed, yeah. I mean, we have to, we have to invest, we have to encourage our policymakers, our governments, you know, the leaders to invest more uh, in technology. Um, you know, connection is still a problem. I, I've just uh, traveled from, uh, we, we, I have a, a lot of info sessions in sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, sometimes when I speak, you know, we get disconnected, you know, it's it's all that. It's it's also in other parts of the world, we have a similar problem. I think we have to make our voices louder and again, more strategic so that we push for reforms, making sure that we are included in the conversation. The current generation now is, uh, is actually live in two worlds. They live fully in the physical world, yes. But, uh, but also physically in the virtual world. So, and there was a study, of course, on, on robot, robots, you know, replacing our jobs. But actually, this is not, if we look at it differently, not about uh, robots replacing our jobs, but making sure that we upskill. Therefore, our institutions, like the higher education institutions, or uh, even like, uh, you know, normal, uh, I mean, school, the, 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 the first time you go to school, it should be responsive to how our world will look like, how our world looks like now and how our world looks like in the future. And the way to do that is to have, you know, these collaborative uh, conversations, making sure that you are part of the decision making process so that you have, you know, uh, a world where technology is not only enabled, but it is fully functional that you as a woman in Africa can, can fully use. And to answer the question on what negative AI can affect in our society, well, of course, like uh, the biases that you have. Uh, a very good example is if you use your phone and if you have like this um, uh, facial recognition. There was uh, there was a study that was made that um, uh, it it only it cannot recognize you know certain colors of faces. It's because much of the data that is being put in is is of a particular color. So if you are of a different color, then it doesn't recognize your face. And therefore, if it doesn't recognize your face, then you don't exist. So it's it's very important, again, and I reiterate it, that you are we are part of the ideation process, of the creation process, and we continue to be part of the monitoring uh, process as well. Vigilance is very important. Uh, inclusion in, in conversations is very important. We have to be part of, of this worldwide, you know, uh, conversations, whether offline or online. Very good. So thank you, Dr. Jenny. We would be here talking about it for a day, right? Thank you very much. Really interesting and a lot, a lot to do. And that is speaking about uh, having our voice louder, so, our next speaker will be a person that person do that. So our next, I'm sorry, someone is, uh, okay. So our next speaker is Maria Ivone Renzamo Bernardo Soares Selemani, most known as Ivone Soares. He's a Mozambican, Mozambican politician and member of a parliament and the University Lecturer of Political Science and International Relations, a published poetry, a media comment, commentator, and a newspaper columnist. Since 2020, she serves in the Mozambican Parliament, Parliament as a Vice President of the Ethics, Ethics Committee in the Himano part now she is member of the National Council. She's, she's the president of the Business and Professional Women chapter of Maputo, Mozambique, and she is found, founder of LEDA, a Mozambican organization 
that stands for Leadership, Education, Democracy, Arts and Environment. She is a PhD candidate on a polit political science. She is very experienced and I've tried to summarize her CV. It's not easy, but because she's very uh, experienced, I hope I've succeeded. Uh, please, Yvonne, the floor is all yours. Succeed. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I have been a mother of five years, uh, twins, and uh, I have been in politics for 30 years and as a parliamentarian for 15 years. I have to know how to reconcile my political, academic, and maternal social family agenda. It has been a remarkable and inspiring journey. As a Mozambican woman, I have a unique perspective to share with the world as my journey has not been like that of the other girls of my generation. I choose politics and uh, with great courage, I choose a party that is in opposition. By the way, the party that leads the opposition in Mozambique. I choose the most difficult path and one where there is a risk of social exclusion and discrimination. But I feel happy with the contribution I have made to promoting the presence of women in decision-making bodies. Within the scope of women's participation in power and decision-making bodies in Mozambique, referring to the period from 2019 to 2023, we in, in 2019, uh, from the 53 existing municipalities, six were presided by women which correspond to around 11% in relation to municipal assemblies. Uh, eight were presided by women, which represent 15%, with a total of uh, 1,196 members, of which 450 were women, corresponding to 37%. The Assembly of the Republic, being the body with the, the greatest visibility with regard to the political participation of women and the 39% uh, female representation at the level of provincial permanent secretaries, it had 54 female representation. During this period, women's participation in local bodies had a rate of 33% of provincial director, 27% of provincial permanent secretaries. Uh, district administration was around 32%. Uh, directors of district, uh, 16%. Heads of administrative posts, 19%. And localities presidents, 21%. At the level of the judiciary, there was an increasing number of women. The justice sector is one of the most promising in terms of women's participation in decision-making bodies. As according to available data, there were around 40% deputy attorneys, general, 37 chief provincial attorneys, 22% consular judge of Supreme Court, and 20% advisor judges of the Constitutional Council at the level of the Bar Association with a representation of 50% of women. That is amazing. In the context of diplomacy in Mozambique, out of a total of, the, of uh, 42 ambassadors and councils, uh, four were women, which corresponds to 9%, around 9%, 9.5%. What keeps me going in confidence that, the, that we are capable as women of achieving our dreams and to do so much empowering and uh, equality. Women let us rise 
let us rise up whenever our homeland needs uh, all calls for us. Let us be active in politics, but let us not neglect our academic training to become better in our field of activity. Let us be competitive and technically competent. University professor, and I am doing a PhD in political science and international relations. This gives me strength in presenting my arguments and in my actions. Promote gender equality. Let's fight for equal opportunities for men and women, especially in positions of power and uh, decision making. Uh, let us not give up uh, participating in political life uh, of our countries. Over the course of 30 years political career, I occupied various positions from the young women who was posting uh, leaflets of the, on the streets to parliamentary leader in the assembly with 89 of deputies. I began my uh, activity at age of 14, now I am 44. <laughs> at the age of 28, I headed the foreign police of the political party and I was a member of the National Political Committee for 12 years. Despite the challenges, I never gave up. My persistence is essential to achieve significant changes. I promote direct dialogue uh, between belligerent leaders and got them to sign an agreement on the cessation of military hostilities in 2014. This was a great personal achievement as I helped to restore peace in my country after a post-electoral uh, conflict. Uh, resilience in difficult times. Let's share how you deal uh, with crises and moments of adversity. Uh, each of us can show how we deal with that. This will uh, for sure inspire uh, other women to stay strong. And uh, together we can make great things in our political action. We aim to explain uh, to women the importance of leading with honesty uh, and uh, lead with transparency. Let us show through our personal examples how trust is essential for peace and stability. And I think it's important to fight corruption in all, all our means. Uh, let me go to the role that I see that is important to breaking barriers, transforming institutions for gender sensitive change. The team brought us together today. The Mozambique Parliament has a crucial role in this transformation. We are the voice of the people and the heart of the democracy. And it is our responsibility to ensure that all voices are heard and respected. Gender equality is not only a basic human right, but also an essential component of sustainable development, peace and prosperity. To break down barriers, we must start within our own institution. This means promoting uh, policies that guarantee the equitable uh, representation of women at all decision-making uh, levels. It also means uh, reviewing and forming laws to eliminate discrimination and support women in all aspects of pub public and private life state policies and budgets must, must help us to make sure that all citizens, regardless of gender, are respected. That is why it is important to make Mozambican parliament to lead by example, approving budgets that include the voice of the opposition that insists that productive areas and the need of industrialization, the country. We look at us, not just in Mozambique, but across the entire African continent. By breaking barriers and transforming our institutions, we will be paving the way for a more just 
in the equal society. Thank you very much to listen to me. Thank you so much, Ivoni. Thank you. What an inspiring um, story. And um, you are really inspiring. And I had the pleasure to meet you at the Night Nations last year. And I was like, wow, what inspiring women. And we have so much to learn from you. And I have something to ask you. What would you say to a girl that is starting in the political career? This is really hard. What would you say to motivate them and not give up? I think she has problems. There, dear? Yes, maybe because she's she's on the way somewhere. So, and she made it. Wow. But now, Vilma? Yes, here. Yeah, now we yes. can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes, I was saying that uh, I was started when I was 14 year old, years old. And it was not easy because uh, I chose the difficult way uh, being a member of one opposition uh, party. Uh, maybe some people can decide to uh, become politicians. And uh, for them, it could be easier to be a member of the ruling party because you have all the opportunities for you no? on your head. But when you choose the difficult uh, way, that is being a member of the opposition, uh, you can have your life uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, barriers. And how to break these barriers is being uh, persistent. You have to follow your instincts and make sure that you are honest. You do your job and you do the job in a very good way, not giving space to the people to appoint you as a corrupt, as a person that are not serious. That, for me, uh, the uh, formula to, to be uh, all these years uh, ahead and make sure that I am... Uh, doing my job and in clear uh, way. Thank you, dear. Dear Bettina, do we have any questions? Yeah, Cindy, any more yeah. questions? Cindy, Cindy Wu is asking, Madame Yvonne Suarez, so powerful and inspiring. May I ask how you find peace in political chaos? Any suggestions you can offer? Can you repeat, please? Madame Yvonne Suarez is so powerful and inspiring. May I ask, how do you find peace in the political chaos? Any suggestions you can offer? How can we fight peace and political chaos? <laughs> it's not, I think we, 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 we have to make sure that the leaders in, in our countries are accountable. We, we never accept a corrupt, uh, presiding us. It's important to have the right people in front of the institutions. And one thing that I, I think is a, a, a kind of a danger for the peace in our countries, in Africa, in this case, is the elections that are not free and fair. If we guarantee that our elections in our countries can be free and fair, for sure, is a very good way to make sure that the peace will prevail and uh, we will not have these post-conflict problems that we can see in Africa and all this coup of it, of uh, the states. We can make sure that the right people are in the right institutions doing the right things for the people, not for themselves, not for their family, not for their girlfriends and things like that. Are we face in Africa. I don't know, uh, uh, in Europe, I think uh, the people are more accountable. You can go to the institution and you can ask for your rights and uh, the institutions works. In Africa, we, we, we are starting to put the institutions working, but it's not easy. And we are not 100% happy because we still have uh, people that pays to get access of justice. 
is not easy to have justice. And this is the way for the world. If you don't have justice, you will not be free and, and, and happy in your country. We have to make sure that all the people understand that if you need to eat, I need to eat, the kids need to eat, the old guys need to eat. If we need water, everybody needs water. It's not, uh, uh, we can't accept people to say that you can live like a, a animal. No, a woman being has the woman rights and these women rights must be respected by all people in the world. Thank you. Thanks, dear Fonny. Really, really inspiring. And we can't uh, wait to listen from you in our webinar in Brazil in April 10th. You are all invited. Yes. We are eager to listen from you and hope to see you in New York New Year, uh, next year for the uh, United Nations events. Thank you so much, yes. dear Yvonne. Thank you. We Thank are you very invited much. to listen pleasure. from you. Thank you, Thank dear. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. And our next speaker today is a very young Vilma. woman. Vilma, I'm yes, sorry. Dear. May I interrupt to you yes, a little dear. bit? Just to warn yes, sir. Uh, all of you that is, is here attending this webinar. As we have the KNA section, the questions that we can't answer here are being answered in this section. Okay? Just let you know. Thank you. Thanks, dear. And now let me introduce you our next speaker. She's Avipsa Prasse. She's a 21 year old university IT student at Dear Walk Institute of Technology and a, a young BPW member from Nepal. Her leadership shines in innovative projects. Avipsa's initiatives showcase the energy between AI and the community service highlighting technologies, positive impact on societal challenges. Avipsa prioritizes striking a balance between technological innovation and ethical responsibility in navigating the dynamic landscape of IT and AI. So Avipsa, let us know more about it. Please, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Voma. Okay. Give me a second, I'll share my screen. Sure. All right. Can you see it? Can you see the screen and am I audible? Yes, you are. Loud and clear. Go ahead. It is not the difference between people that is the difficulty. It is the indifference. Hello, a very warm greetings and namaste. I'm Avipta Prasai, a young BPW member from Nepal. We know the barriers of gender bias and inequality have long cast shadow over our institution, shaping policies and practices that fail to reflect rich diversity of human talents. So from corporate boardrooms to legislative halls, uh, you know, we see under representation of women and gender minorities in our field, that results in, in all terms of innovation, empathy, and justice. So when we look at uh, the IT field, when we, if we dive into the world of information and technology, we are faced with continuous and widespread issue, the underrepresentation of women. And as you can see in the screen, it is seen that only 17% of major technology jobs, including programming, software development, are held by women. Now, you can see this chart. You can see this shows, this indicates that, you know, the female employees in work force of major technological companies. So in the blue, you can see the total workforce. In the orange, you can see leadership uh, jobs, whereas in aqua or green, you can see tech jobs. So you can compare the, you know, compare the numbers and look at the, uh, look at the screen to me to compare the major, you know, numbers of the companies of major IT companies. Only forty-five percent in Amazon are 
women employees, whereas only 29 of them are in leadership roles. So similarly, you can compare yourself for Facebook, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. This results in you know, lack of perspective with effective innovations and creativity. So we must remember to hire for skills and not degree. And we must you know, encourage women to pursue tech careers. And we also have seen very few women pursuing STEM education. In this image, this image shows the subject that male and female students studied at UK colleges in academic year 2013 and 14. So the chart highlights the difference between uh, subject preferences. You know, women tend to have, tend to go or gravitate towards medical and social uh, stream, social sciences, the field essential for healthcare and uh, you know involving caring of patients and conducting research development treatment whereas men show stronger interest in engineering and physical sciences that encompasses of you know uh, designing building maintaining structures machines and system also 49 percent of women who originally intend to major in science and engineering as a first year switch to a non-stream major so this has a significant impact as there's only limited uh, talent for tech roles. So encouraging girls' uh, interest in STEM education from very small age is very necessary. Gender discrimination is also seen in workplace. So it is seen that 57% of women in tech have you know, experienced gender discrimination compared to 10% of men, but more in you know, a common example, I can you can see it here. I think most of us have faced it. 88% 88 of uh, people have or had clients or colleagues who have uh, who questioned the male peers that should have been addressed to them. So this is commonly seen in you know our sector. So this uh, results in reduced job satisfaction, demotivates the women in this sector to you know for for the growth and the it hinders their growth overall. Also, one of the major, um, you know, effect of this gender uh, d discrimination can be taken as gender pay gap, which I attribute to various factors, including occupational segregation, discrimination, lack of transparency in salary negotiations. So certain, you know, industries such as technology finance tend to have wider pay gaps. So women are often underrepresented in higher paying fields. So this can hinder women's um, you know, career post pro progression, low salary may discourage them uh, from seeking you know, promotions or anything like that. And over a lifetime, the pay gap accumulates, resulting in significant difference in retirement savings. So women retire with smaller pension and social security benefits due to lower earnings. Another one is often women face challenges while balancing work and family responsibilities. It reduces the productivity. So we must ensure flexible work and arrangements, you know, along with parental leave policies for women. Now, this is the main one, biasness. Conscious or unconscious. We see biasness during hiring, promotion, during everything in this sector. For example, this one. Can you read the screen? So yeah, 75 of the women were asked about family, marital status, children during interviews, whereas we don't see such questions being asked for men commonly, you know. This is one of the major unconscious bias we may find in our workplace. So this creates unequal opportunity for career advancement and we must implement you know, blind recruitment practices, transform, you know, transparent promotional criteria. So now let us, I have, we've got three theories for gender gap in IT sector. So let us just go briefly through it. So first one is role congruity theory. So this theory proposes that people choose career path based on attributes they were socialized to value. So men are most motivated by, you know, agent goals like, power, money, individual uh, achievements, whereas women, on the other hand, are more, you know, driven towards communal goal, like which 
include social interaction, sense of responsibility. So these are all on my side. I think it's nurtured by the false stereotype that IT and engineering is, you know, men's field. My question to you all is how and when did we start uh, being natured by this false stereotype that IT and engineering is men's field when the first computer programmer was a lady? Let us go to our second theory, which is expectancy and value theory, which involves particularly self-confidence and interest. So it says that we, you know, we select career based on our interest in particular field and success. So we determine how successful we'll be and we select the, you know, field according to the abilities. And this is the last one, which is the field specific ability beliefs theory. So which suggests that men and women, they, you know, they're stereotyped by initiate uh, ability that is perceived by, you know, skills required to excel certain field uh, silent to men. So based on this theory, women tend to grow apart or grow away, not because they are not good at things, but rather because there are greater number of career options to them available elsewhere, where they find it better, uh, you know, better to go or they have better opportunity. Now, let us see what breaking barriers mean. So breaking bar barrier means dismantling the structure of discrimination and biasness that pro back progress and rebuild the institution based on principle and equity. So let us have a sol some solutions to it. Promo uh, sorry, promoting equal opportunities. I, I don't think I need to go one by one. <laughs> Raising awareness, flexible policies, equal pay and transparency, diverse hiring practice, support network communities, leadership development, challenge workplace culture, promote role models, advocate for policy change. And to you all, if you are thinking, how can you get involved? These are some of the things you can do versus education and advocacy. So you could stay informed and advocate, you know, educate yourself about the gender disparities in tech and speak up about it, speak up about it in conference, uh, workshops and webinars, online platforms. Second one is support women in tech. So we can do it through mentoring, networking, you know, attend women focused tech events and connect with the other professional. Networking really helps to build supportive community. Promote inclusive hiring practice. So in this, we can really go into diverse panels and bias trainings, encouraging conference and events to have diverse panels and speakers and advocate for bias trainings during recruitment process or minimizing unconscious biasness. Volunteer and participate. So there are various of, uh, you know, organizations who are uh, aiming to close the gender gap. For example, we can say Girls Who Code. So we could, you know, collaborate and volunteer in, in those organizations, or we could also participate or organize hackathons, coding events, tech meetups, so we can do that. Advocate for equal pay. So salary, transparency, and negotiation skills. Those are major two points when I talk about advocating for equal pay. Similarly, promoting STEM education for girls. So school programs, floating clubs, we are all good at it, I guess. And challenge stereotypes and bias. So we need to be mindful of the language that reinforces, you know, stereotypes. Avoid phrases like coding is for boys. And representation, like, you know, we need to have a positive role model that highlights successful women in takes. Also create safe, safe space. So we can have support groups, zero tolerance. So, you know, you ensure all the workplace have zero tolerance for harassment or discrimination. Learn and share allyship so you can do it through training and you know use our platform to amplify the voices for women and underrepresented groups. Lead by example, so inclusive uh, leadership, jump and cha change. So we can have all these advocating policies to create equitable, you know, workspace. So now let us pause 
and reflect on the power of collective actions. The ones and zeros we manipulate hold the promise of more balanced binary, a world where if statement does not discriminate on basis of our chromosome. So let us imagine a compiler that does not discriminate, you know, that does not care about your pronoun, but just your algorithm. Picture a debugger that fixes bias, not just box. And envision a API that connects heart, mind, and line of codes across continents. As we debug through the matrix of this inequality, remember the diversity isn't a bug, it's our feature. Our code base tribe when all, we all embrace the all colors of syntax. So let us refactor our industry. Let us redefine the parameters of success. Let us compile a future where women lead, where minorities thrive and where all binaries become language of unity. And finally, as we hit run, May our screen light up with progress and our algorithm echo with justice. Change starts from our home, our school, our society, and from all of us. The change starts with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear. Thank you. So inspiring. So inspiring. Yes. So we need started with us. The bias, the biases still need to be worked and learned in order to eliminate. And of course, we have our voices louder. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bettina, dear Bettina, do we have any questions for? Not, not yet, not at the moment. No questions. No. Okay, so after I have one. How can an educational institutions, technology companies, and governments work together to transform and foster gender responsive change in IT sector? It's much more. Of course, you brought to us some ideas and some insights, but how, in fact, we could move in our places, you know, or make it yes. in our places. My my uh, my understanding on this is, from very small age, you know, we have a stereotype like boys like blue, girls like pink. Similarly, engineering is a men's job. You know, that's how uh, our brains have been shaped from very small age. So change starts from a home, from ourselves. So maybe if we could, you know, foster a child saying no. You can have this, you can achieve anything, you can be an engineer from very small age, shaping, you know, it's the responsibility of home or society. So whereas if, when we go to institution or, you know, educational institutes, we have seen, we have also seen through research that uh, teachers tend to, you know, unconsciously, uh, you know, ba bias the boys saying uh, girls are not good at maths or something as such. Yeah. So, I think we need to change our mentality, our stereotype to shape the children's mind. And when we, you know, when we grow, first of all, I think it's all in our brains. And second one is, of course, we can have education, uh, training classes, educational classes, uh, the, you know, the platforms before internships, we could have trainings to the women, to the girls. Also, with uh, if we talk about more, you know, aged women, we could have some flexibility in their work, you know, schedule. So because as women need to, has that tendency to balance the work life and personal life, we could have more flexible schedules to them. So as governments, uh, schools, home, I think they, all these three have their own, you know, different ways they can correspond to these issues. If that answers the question. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Pisa. Bettina, do, do we? Yes, we do. Now we have questions. Joe Alcock is asking, are we aware of any organizations or institutions that have followed a training strategy or culture transformation process using the identification of personal bias, please? And then there's a second question. Can I also say, can I read that? It's Patrizia, yeah. Mil Patrizia Milani, she asks, how do you envision AI breaking barriers and transforming traditional institutions for the young generation? All right. So um, there are several, I think I've got like 
10 organizations uh, that I'm aware of. I will just send you the, you know, in the text below, I'll just send you the link. So the girls who code, and then uh, there are some trainings uh, in Nepal, there are some trainings in the Frog Institute of Technology where we have women training with, from women trainers. So I've got like, I think I've got 10 uh, institutes I can talk about it. So I'll just uh, send it to you. And also, how did I envision AI breaking bird? Okay, so AI, AI has been transforming everything for us. So working with AI has been <laughs> difficult to some extent, but easy as well. So uh, how, as I envision AI breaking, uh, you know, traditional um, barriers, I think as, uh, sorry, as Jenny said, if we get uh, involved into, you know, development of AI, if we are included while it is being created, we are part of it. We are initially the part of it. So we we can't be left behind because we know equally and we are participating equally in this matter. So uh, if I uh, talk about how, you know, traditionally institutions, sorry, how I, AI has been breaking barriers and transforming in traditional institution, you can see simple examples like traditionally we had been, you know, writing some you know it is on our own it had been all on our own but right now we've got a lot of uh, you know AI copilot chat gpt to do our work so it's it's easy for us but at the same time i feel that it has uh, created some issues of job displacements too so for younger generation it might be a chance for good or bad it can be both so if that answers it. Yes, we hope so. Any more, Bettina? Yes, now Cindy Wu has written, yes. it was an honor to meet and have chatted with Avipsa during the recent Taiwan's Young BBW Forum. Thank you for today's inspiring sharing. You're welcome to come to Taiwan again to give talks. We enjoy your insights. It's not a question. Thank you so much, Cindy. I'd love to see you as well. Great, great. So closing, uh, not closing, but also adding something in our presentation. As Sherry Sandberg once said, one time said, that in the future we will have leaders and no more female leaders, only leaders, right? So thank you, Afiza. Thank you for all insights and the mindsets and uh, ideas and brought all the, the things for us. So dears, uh, one more time, uh, questions that we can't answer here. The speakers will, will answer there in the Q&A um, sections, or also we can send it to them and then they will uh, answer by awesome. emails, okay? So take advantage at uh, as we have a big team and experienced team of great women here, I would like to invite also uh, Dr. Narudi. Dr. Narudi is with us. Yes. Dr. Narudi Kin City as a regional coordinator of Asia, Asia and, uh, and uh, Asia Pacific uh, to say some words to us, right? So join us and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Claudia. You. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Well, um, all the panelists and all the participants, I think this is a very worthwhile session that we just have. A lot of varieties of um, efficient women. We have heard many good ideas and, you know, um, we should break all the barriers by inclusive of our action for the sustainable goal. Um, there are linkage of everything in this world. Um, when people think, most of the people will think that climate change doesn't have anything to do with trafficking, but actually, if you really think about it, there's some linkage there too. You know, for example, that um, 
in many countries when they have climate problems, it affects um, low income people. Um, most of them uh, affect their way of living, their lives, their career, their housing. So um, a lot of them end up having to, you know, put their daughters uh, into trafficking to get money to to for their house to fix and to live on. Um, the parents and the rest of the family will have um, lives go on. But what about um, the girl's life who was trafficking? So um, this uh, is just one sample to show that um, everything in this world have linkage. Okay, there's a proverb in Thailand that I like very much and I'd like to share with this panel. Um, it said that if a flower was picked, it could affect the universe. So think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naruji. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and give us this pleasure. Okay. So, dears, I think we are almost finalizing our big webinar with so many ideas, insights, and a big picture of all the technologies and good things that we have in front of us already. But before that, I would like to call back our dear VP, Toi Ti, to give us some words before we finish. Right? So, welcome. Thank you, Claudia. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. So, inspira inspiration from all our great speakers. I learned a lot of things today, too. As we draw to close the, this uh, parallel event of 68th session of Commission on the Status of Women, the discussion insight and collective commitment. Um, throughout our time together, uh, we have dived deep into challenges and opportunities surrounding gender equality and women's empowerment. I extend my heartfelt thanks to our distinguished speaker, uh, passionate participants. It's very important. If we don't have participants, so nobody will listen to us. Oh, thank you to all of you. And uh, dedicate organizer team, of course, all the team of organizing this event for their dedication and contribution to this event. Your presence has made this gathering a true success. Thank you. As our BPW International theme, new actions through corporations, let us continue this journey together, unite our pursuit of more just and equitable world. Uh, and I would like to say, please take good care of yourself because our health is very important and uh, safe travel back home wherever you are. And uh, until we meet again, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, dear. Thank you. So before we really close this webinar, I would like to thank you, all of you around the world that could be with us this period here, especially my dear VP, Toi Tin Shurelat, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Naruji of Pisa, all the speakers, President Catherine, Dr. Jenny, Yvonne, and also especially Vilma, thank you for supporting me and sharing this webinar with me. And Bettina, Bettina, our efficient secretary, is always standing with us. So thank you for all support. Ursula, I can't, I cannot say anything about to you. Thank you, only thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for everybody for the opportunity and being here during this period, which was very motivational, inspiring, and let's continue. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claudia, for this opportunity. Gratitude.
And Thank you, girls. we don't forget, we don't forget our co-sponsor, PASIWA, Pan, uh, Women Pan Pacific, Asian Pacific. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you, dear. So you all can turn on microphone and say goodbye to our audience and each other. Thank you, Claudia, the best moderator. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 See you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you.